where we will discuss microcontroller timing analysis. Timing is very important for a lot of different applications. So if you think about the various clocks that exist, it could be just a regular wall clock, any kind of a digital clock relies upon timing and we have standards such as how long a second, a minute, an hour last and those things need to be incorporated into any kind of a digital device that will track time. That could be a clock used at a sporting event to count the amount of time remaining in a period or count the time that has elapsed since the beginning of the game. That could be for cooking applications where you set a timer um, for a particular thing to cook it could be for various alarms, so if you wanted to wake up at a specific time, you would need to keep track of what the time is and how much time is remaining until that alarm goes off. We also need to transmit data within a specific time interval. So it's important that data is sent at an expected rate and received at an expected rate. So anything that is sent serially across the web, between devices, including Bluetooth, things sent uh, to electronic commerce sites, all of those things rely on data transmission and the data being sent at a specific rate. You can also think about blinking lights. So the turn signals on cars should blink at an interval such that they are fast enough that the car behind is able to notice that it is a turn signal indicating the desire to take a turn, but not so fast as to be distracting or blinding to the driver behind them. And you also need to think about various other displays, whether those are Christmas lights or advertising displays. You want things to blink at an attractive frequency, but not a frequency that will be so overwhelming as to be distracting. You also might have warning indicators indicating something needs your attention, and so you need to think about the frequency at which that should blink on and off. There are various mechatronic systems, including robotics, for which movement is very timed, and you need to make sure that things are on and off in the right time intervals. Manufacturing has critical timing processes. So certain things need to happen first, certain things need to happen second, and it takes a certain speed of a conveyor belt moving parts, a certain uh, number of movements and an amount of time in those movements for all of those things to come together, particularly in automated manufacturing environments. And also within medical systems. So things like an IV drip needs to be dripping for a certain amount of time. You might also have patient monitoring systems and want to make sure that after a certain amount of time maybe they are turned by um, staff or something like that to prevent things like pressure ulcers. So timing is everywhere and we want to make sure we understand timing and since we're talking about microcontrollers we want to understand timing within the digital domain and how that can be used. In this slide set, we're going to be looking at the timing of code in assembly and specifically on our Explorer 8 trainer board, which uses an 8 megahertz crystal oscillator as the clock source for our microcontroller. There are many different clock sources available, but the external crystal oscillator is what we will use. There is also an option for our clock to use what is known as a phase lock loop, which will allow us to actually multiply the frequency of our crystal oscillator by four. So while we have a nominal eight megahertz crystal oscillator, we can actually have an oscillation at 32 megahertz from the PLL. When it comes to executing instructions, every instruction cycle takes four periods of the clock whether that happens to be the clock with the PLL or without the PLL. And so if you take 8 megahertz and divide that by 4, that gets us down to a 2 megahertz clock. And if you were to look at that in terms of the amount of time that passes in each period there, that works out to 500 nanoseconds if we're not using the PLL. If we are using the PLL, we get one fourth of that, and so it would take 125 nanoseconds for each instruction, one cycle of the instruction to be executed. As we will see shortly, some instructions take one cycle and some instructions take two cycles. So for some of the instructions that we will use, it will take one full microsecond if we're not using the PLL or 250 nanoseconds with the PLL. Before we continue into doing general timing analysis, I want to introduce one more command in assembly, and that is the NOOP. 
which is short for no operation. Some people call it a NOP, but it is basically doing nothing other than wasting a single instruction cycle. And so in this case, if we need to delay for 500 nanoseconds, executing a single no op is the way to do that. So how can we time instructions? If you look at table 33-3, which is on page 388 in the data sheet, it lists all of the assembly commands that we can use with our PIC microcontroller. You will notice that some of them are one instruction cycle, others are two instruction cycle, and some of them are odd instructions that take one cycle in certain instances and two cycles in another. So for example, increment F skip if zero or decrement F skipping if zero, if it's just decrementing or incrementing and not skipping, it is a one cycle command. But in the instance where it does get to zero and does skip, that is a two cycle command. The same thing is true for our bit tests. If we do a bit test skipping if clear or skipping if set, in the instance where it does skip, that takes two, but if it's just a bit test and falls through to the next command, that is a one cycle command. Here is a reproduction of a portion of that table, and this shows our byte oriented operations. As you can see, almost all of these are one cycle commands. So if you do an addition, if you do a clear, if you do a complement, all of these different things, when they're executed one time, it takes one instruction cycle. These decrement and increment, as I mentioned, they are listed as one with two in parentheses because nominally, most of the time, they are going to be one cycle commands, but in the instance when you do decrement or increment and the result is zero and it skips, that will be a two cycle command. Looking further at the rest of this table, bit clearing, bit setting, also one cycle command. Our bit tests, as we mentioned, one and sometimes two if there is a skip. Our literal operations, adding, inclusive oring, moving, all those kind of things, those are one cycle command. And down here, where you have control operations, they are mostly two cycle commands. And so these include things like calling subroutines, returning from subroutines. Um, we haven't talked about returning from interrupts or interrupts in general yet. We will talk about those soon, but that is a special kind of return from an interrupt service routine. We also have our go-tos, so anytime we have these types of commands, they take two instruction cycles. So how do we compute the runtime? Well, for every instruction that we have in our code, the first thing we need to do is determine how many clock cycles it will take to execute. So if we executed it just one time, how many clock cycles? Is it a one cycle or a two cycle command, or is it sometimes one and sometimes two? Then we need to determine how many times will that command be executed. And then it's a simple matter of multiplying. How many times is that command executed? How many times is that instruction, uh, how many cycles is that instruction? And then we get to our instruction cycle time. And so if we're not using the PLL, we would multiply that by 500 nanoseconds. If we are, we multiply it by 125 nanoseconds or whatever the instruction cycle time would happen to be in a different application. So that is just the specific timing for our microcontroller with our clock with or without the PLL. And so then we just simply add up the total time for all of the instructions together. So let's see an example here. If we had a call to a subroutine wait and then we see the subroutine down here, how much total time would elapse? Well, the call itself will be executed one time and that is a two cycle command and then we get into the subroutine and let's just understand the structure it's going to load four into w it's going to move that into count and then it gets down here into this loop where it is decrementing count and then skipping if it gets to zero but otherwise it's hitting this go to and it's going back so the wait gets executed just once just calling the wait the call is once that's a two cycle command once we get into the subroutine, the label doesn't take any amount of time, but the first two commands are just loading in that counter, and each of those are one cycle commands. Then if we think about how many times this is going to decrement, well, it's going to decrement from four to three, three to two, and two to one without skipping. So that's three times at one cycle, and then the last time it will go from one to zero and will skip. So one time at two cycles. 
and then this go to will be executed every time it does not skip and so that's three times and the go to is a two cycle command and finally it will hit the return which will execute exactly once and that is a two cycle command so if we add one times two so that's two plus one plus one plus five plus six plus two that works out to 17 cycles and if we are not using the PLL and we are using our 8 megahertz clock each of those cycles takes half of a microsecond or 500 nanoseconds so this entire execution would take 8.5 microseconds continuing on to our next example here we have computing the runtime again, no PLL, calling a wait, and in this case we are now adding a no op inside of this loop. So our call once again is executed once with two cycles, then we are loading in the W register with four, that's going to execute once for one cycle, we're moving that to count once for one cycle, then the no op happens every time we go through the loop, the first time every time we do that um, and go back to loop. So that's going to happen four times. That is a one cycle command. The decrement happens a total of four times, three times without skipping, once with skipping. So that's three times one cycle plus one times two cycles. Again, the go to executes three times, two cycles each, and the return, one time and two cycles. So all together, if we add that up, we get two plus one plus one plus four plus five plus six plus two and that works out to 21 cycles or 10.5 microseconds. We can also design for delay time so we can analyze and determine how long something is going to last but we can also design so typically what we're going to do if we wanted to design a delay subroutine we would use a for loop we would initialize a counter and determine how many times we want to go through the loop and just decrement and in some cases we would add no ops to allow that delay loop to take a little bit longer. And so we can use some algebra to determine how many passes through the loops will result in our desired delay. So if we look at this example, we could ask ourselves if this is our basic structure for a loop, a wait subroutine, how long would be the longest time that this delay code could run for any number that we could put in here? Well, you may be tempted to say, well, let's just put the largest number that we have, that would be FF. And so if we put FF, then FF would go into W, that would go into count, and the decrement would come down from 255 to 254, 253, and every one of those times it wouldn't skip until it gets all the way down to 1, and then it would skip. So this would decrement 254 times without skipping, once with skipping, and then this go to would be executed 254 times. You might also notice that if you were to start at zero, it would actually decrement to 255 first. That would not skip. So in fact, the longest delay code that you could put in would have this starting at zero and decrement down to 255 first. And then that really just adds a little bit more time going through this loop. So it's a simple matter of doing all the algebra to determine, okay, if I were to put in zero and to decrement it down, how long would it run? So what can we do to lengthen the delay time? Well, we could add some no ops, and we can also add some nested loops, so calling an interior loop with the exterior loop. So here's an example of a nested loop delay. And in this case, let's trace through what we understand is going to happen and then we can get into the specificity of the timing. So in this case we're going to load FF into W, we're going to put this into a counter, counter 1, that's going to be our counter for our outer loop, then within our counter in the inner loop we're going to load up another FF and put that in counter 2 and then inside of the inner loop we're going to have a no op, a no op and keep decrementing counter 2 and going back to inner. So we're going to keep going through this inner loop until counter 2 gets back to 0 every time and then we're going to decrement counter 1 and that will keep going back to the outer loop reloading counter 2 
every time until counter one gets all the way to zero. So let's start looking at these commands and think about how often do each of them get executed. And we won't just go line by line, we can actually just look from the outside in. So the first thing to notice is this first movement of FF into W will execute one time, and that is a one cycle command, as will the movement into counter one. At the end, we can also notice that the return gets executed exactly once, and that's a two cycle command. Looking further down at the outer loop, we notice that the decrement of counter one happens in our outer loop, and that will go from 255 down to zero with it not skipping 254 times and the last time being the skip. The go to outer will execute every time that there is not a skip, and so that will be 254 times, and the go to is a two cycle command. Now, we can look at loading up FF and moving that into counter two. That happens every time we go through this loop. So that is going to be 255 times. So every time we go through, whether we're going to skip or not skip, these two commands get executed. They are both one cycle commands. Then when we get into the inner loop, the inner loop, the entirety of that loop will execute 255 times. And then we need to know, okay, within that inner loop, how many times are each of those instructions working? So in this case, the two no ops will execute 255 times 255 times. Then this decrement of counter two will go through the inner loop 255 times and within the inner loop, it, when it's not skipping, it's one cycle. When it is skipping, it's two. So it'll have 254 times of not skipping at one cycle, one time at two cycles for every time we execute that inner loop and the go to enter will be executed 255 times for the whole loop and then it also gets executed within every pass through the loop 254 times whenever the decrement counter to does not skip go to enter gets executed and if we multiply all of these out and add them up we get 326,148 cycles which if you multiply that by point five microseconds per cycle that works out to 163.074 milliseconds. So this entire nested delay loop will last for 163.074 milliseconds.